Thanks to Stephen Scarf for um, giving me the opportunity to give this talk here today, Prony. Um, my own interest in the topic comes from uh, FIFA Avalanche Research Scholarship I completed in 2014. Um, I initially had covered the period from 1945 to 2010 and I interviewed 30 players who'd played in England and Scotland in that period. Um, after I finished the report, I decided to extend the um, research and took on the period from the 1880s up until the start of the Second World War. So I'm going to just um, go through um, the cases of players who've gone to Britain and also to the USA, to the American Soccer League from 1921 to 1931. And um, particularly, um, I was able to utilize Prony's Irish People Association archive to obtain information on the American Soccer League in that period that wasn't really in any of the local newspapers. So um, that, was, that was definitely something that helped me a lot. Um, so just to begin, um, Irish-born footballers have been present in Britain's football leagues since the late 1880s. Their migration has generally been to England, where the English Football League was founded in 1888, with professionalism in England legalised by the Football Association three years before this. In the pre-World War II period, Irish-born football migrants were the largest non-British category of players to appear in Scotland and England's football leagues. However, by the late 20th century, the number of Irish-born <coughs> players appearing in top-flight English football had declined significantly, with the internationalisation of the Premier League in the 1990s leading to fewer opportunities for these players to break into this level of professional football. Irish sporting migrants' movement has generally been like much global sports migration from the periphery to the core. As Alan Goodman has written more broadly of this genre of sports history, soccer players are the most numerous migrants. Tony Jude has noted that in the post-war years, what really united Europe was football, and has stated that a generation after England had been beaten on home soil by Hungary in 1953, major European football clubs had a cosmopolitan roster of players drawn from many different countries. On a broader scale, the work of Derby, Akindas and Kirwan has highlighted how African football migrants tended to move to Europe from their continent's two primary player exporting zones, North Africa and those coastal nations in the sub-Saharan West. Player movement has been restricted by regulations on clubs signing foreign players at various stages throughout the 20th century, however. For example, although the ban which had effectively been in place since 1931 on bringing non-British and Irish footballers into English football was removed in 1978, it was not until the 1990s that the movement of foreign players into English football became more prominent. In particular, the 1995 Bosman ruling was undoubtedly significant in assisting increased movement of players who were European Union citizens. Higher financial gains for players at English clubs came with satellite television deals and affluent owners willing to spend big meant that Britain went from being an oasis of foreign talent into a prime destination for the modern football migrant. Pierre Lanfranchi and Matthew Taylor have identified three main situations involving push and pull factors which favour the economic migration of professional footballers. Players' migration has been influenced by economic crisis and national financial weakness, while in some countries a failure to develop full-time professional football has led to player movement. In addition, elite players now have a tendency to move to wealthy European leagues where the highest wages are paid. As will be seen, Irish players' movements has been affected by all three factors, although their movement to European clubs has never been a prominent trend. While Republic of Ireland born players' success as professional footballers has generally been linked with unpopular memory to the Jack Charlton years from 1986 to 1995, there were some notable successes for Irish born players in England in the pre World War II period. In particular, by the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, Donegal born Billy Gillespie had become the first Irishman to captain an FA Cup winning team in 1925 while Dublin native Jimmy Dunn's record of scoring in 12 consecutive English League matches in the 1931-2 season remains unbeaten today. The presence of Irish-born football migrants in England and of course in Scotland also had an impact on the international game and the standard of the Irish national team's play. 1914 saw Ireland's first outright victory in the British Home Championship when they captured the title after drawing with Scotland 
having beaten England and Wales over a three week period. Of the 15 players used in that Irish squad in that campaign, 10 were based at Scottish or English clubs, illustrating a change in selection policy since the late 1890s. While post World War II migration for association football purposes from Ireland has been relatively well assessed, the period from the late 19th century until the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939 has received less attention from historians. Irish born footballers migrating in the 20th century generally looked to Britain with well developed leagues in existence there. The English Football League, having been founded in 1888, was professionals and founded, legalised by the Football Association in 1885. <coughs> They were present in the Football League's opening season and the period from 1888 until the league was suspended with the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, 286 Irish-born players appeared for English clubs, while at least 37 appeared in the American Soccer League between 1921 and 1931. The close proximity of England and Scotland and the development of scouting networks in the northeast of Ireland by the early 1900s, not to mention the relative ease of transport, helped explain why Irish players were generally drawn to professional football there. Although at times some English and Scottish based players did move to Irish clubs, a higher standard of the game was available in Britain than that, than that in Ireland, although the maximum wage introduced in 1901 and not lifted until 1961 meant that players also generally worked part time. This paper will look at how these patterns of migration compare with wider studies of the Irish diaspora. It will be shown that Belfast was the leading centre of Irish football migration in the early 1900s and assess how rates of migration developed on a decade by decade basis. Not every Irish born player who appeared in English league football moved directly from an Irish league club and the role of the military in this will also be examined. According to Enda Delaney, from the early 1920s until the end of the 20th century, roughly 1.5 million people left independent Ireland and in excess of 500,000 people emigrated from Northern Ireland. In addition, he has noted that Britain was the principal destination for 20th century Irish emigrants with greater accessibility available than to other areas such as North America and Australia. And the need for labour and strong and expensive transport networks were all fundamental to this. Similarities in culture and a lack of entry restrictions were also significant in making this decision. Although Irish immigration to Britain was certainly not a new phenomenon in the post-partition years after 1922, what was new was that it now became the destination of the great majority. In the 19th century, North America had been a destination for most Irish immigrants, but a significant decline in this regard in the years between the First and Second World Wars. While legislation implemented in the USA between 1921 and 1924 ensured that the number of immigrants from Free State Ireland had decreased from an average of 25,000 annually in the middle of this decade to over 14,000 in 1930, it was the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the worldwide economic depression which subsequently followed, which is the main reason why Irish immigration to North America declined in the 1930s. The Second World War and its immediate aftermath saw Britain emerge as a main destination for the majority of Irish immigrants. As will be seen, Irish football migrants differed significantly to these patterns. The Irish Football Association had been founded in 1880 to govern association football throughout Ireland. This was a Belfast based organisation and after a number of disputes concerning what Leinster clubs deemed as unfair treatment, particularly over the selection of international players and the hosting of cup ties, Dublin clubs split from the IFA in 1921 and formed the Football Association of Ireland, which was renamed the Football Association of the Irish Free State in 1923. As Neil Garnham has noted, Belfast-based players were being sought for recruitment by Scottish clubs since 1889. The first Irish-born footballer to feature in English league football, Archie Goodall, played at the beginning of the 1888-89 season for initial double winners Preston North End, appearing in two games before moving to Aston Villa. He was born in Belfast to a Scottish soldier in 1864, a year after his brother John, who had a slightly longer spell at Preston, was born in London. The younger good old brother began his early football career in Liverpool, having evidently moved there without playing the game at a senior level in Ireland. Later capped at international level, his style of play was described vividly by a reporter in sport in 1900. He wrote, 
When in his talks on the field, his every manner at once proclaims a master. He never seems to bustle or move about much, but he has an instinct which always prompts correct movements, and he is generally in the proximity of the ball and doing the right thing. He is equally good at attack or defence and is a dangerous shot. Although Belfast born John McVicker had moved to Accrington via Birmingham St George in 1891, and both Bob Crone and Jack Taggart had, moved, had joined West Bromwich Albion in 1892 via Middlesbrough, having initially left distillery. It was not until 1893 that direct moves from Irish League clubs to those in the English League were beginning to become more common. Tommy Ching Morrison and Zach Johnson both joined Burnley from Glentorn, said to be one of the most entertaining clubs in Belfast at that time, while William Michael Purves also left the Belfast club to join Small Heath. In addition, John Peden left Linfield to join Newton Heath, who later became known as Manchester United, that year, with money a significant motivating factor. Peden, described as a celebrated left winger of Linfield, was said to have at last succumbed to the blandishments of the English professional agent and taken a place in England at £100 down and £3 a week afterwards in March of that year. Direct moves from Dublin clubs to England were slower to develop which suggests that scouting networks there were not as strong, along with the reputation of the game there as opposed to Belfast. Val Harris appears to be the first player who moved from a Dublin club to England to play league football there, joining Everton from Shelburne in 1907, while the following year, Billy Lacey also joined the Merced team from the same club. The proposed movement of Harry Buckle from Cliftonville to Sunderland in 1902 drew concern from the Belfast Telegraph's football columnist, Ralph the Rover, who felt that I must say I am distinctly opposed to this promiscuous signing on by Irish players for English clubs. The English clubs, I am convinced, have two ends in view when they approach an Irish player of ability. The first is the possibility of his playing for them, and the second the possibility of a substantial fee being obtained should such a player sign a professional form for another club. It has been stated that Sutherland has signed on Harry Buckle of Cliftonville. If this be correct, Buckle cannot now play for another team in English league competition until he has been transferred by Sunderland, who will probably ask a substantial sum for doing so. Who is the gainer in this case? The Irish Football Association were also raising concerns with the International Football League Board, an Anglo-Scot organisation founded in 1897, about English clubs poaching of Irish players by the early 1900s, with the board agreeing in June 1904 that during the month of May, the traditional end of season time, 48 hours notice had to be given to Scottish and Irish clubs before their players could be approached about relocating. This did not resolve the issue as in 1908, Distillery FC reported Glasgow Rangers to the IFA for approaching McCracken, the right full back, and his place of employment before 7 a.m. in the morning, without either asking or receiving permission to do so. But they also offered him work in the Fairfield shipyard, prompting the Belfast club to ask the IFA if they would take such steps as would prevent the Rangers or any other club about from tampering with their players in the future. The IFA committee agreed to send a letter to the Scottish FA as the chairman said it was the first time such a thing had cropped up so far as the Scottish Football Association was concerned with the club in Ireland. This seems unlikely. By 1902, one Belfast reporter estimated that a total of 21 Irish players had migrated to play for cross-channel clubs, while in August 1904, it was stated in the same newspaper that the migration of Irish players has set in. An Anglo-Irish Football League board was set up in 1914, mainly to prevent English-based players moving to Ireland and aim to meet on the eve of inter-league matches, or as occasions may require. The board claimed to have the power to deal with offenders who improperly approach players, but as Taylor states, the major threat to the Football League's control over its labour force continued to come from Ireland. The following year, the Scottish and Irish Football League board was established, with four representatives selected from the Scottish League, while the Irish League was said to have three delegates. So you can just see from that table there, um, the <coughs> this is taken from Michael Joyce's players' records, and some players were identified only as born in Ireland, and you can see how the figures rose there from, nine, from the 1888 to the 1899 period to 25. Um, and in the first decade of the 20th century, there wasn't too much of an increase. I suppose really the, um, 
second deck in 1910 and 1919. The low figures can be explained by the, the stoppage of football during the First World War, and I'll talk about that in more detail. 1920s, there was a, a, a big increase, and again, I'm going to discuss that. Um, and then 1930s, um, the number declined again with the, with the Depression. Um, so these figures were a lot lower than the ones, who, the ones for the players that moved after the um, Second World War. Obviously, there was better pay after 1960, and there was um, opening up of scouting networks and, and um, so on like that. So the exact Irish town or city of birth of each player who migrated could not be identified. Um, but overall figures per decade illustrate a rise from 25 to 1888 to 1899 um, until the opening decade of the 20th century, 35. And again, the, the, only, the only slight um, increase in the 1910s can be explained by the outbreak of the First World War. There was also difficult relations between the Football League and the Irish League during the First World War, with some English players joining Irish clubs and using false names, while the IFA were in turn unhappy with some English clubs for signing players registered with Belfast clubs and temporarily increased on sanctioning all transfers of Irish players to England in the years before the foundation of the FAA in 1921. Um, and during, the, during the First World War, I suppose research on professional footballers in Ireland who, who fought in the, the First World War is um, sort of still in its infancy, but there have been some uh, notable um, cases like Bernard Donaghy who um, died at the Battle of Somme on the 1st of July 1916. There was also Charlie O'Hagan and his nephew Billy O'Hagan, both Irish internationals who, who fought in the, in the First World War, um, but I'm not going to talk too much about, about that period today. Um, and just looking at the 1920s, Matthew Taylor has noted that International and interleague matches were seen by top British clubs as a way of spotting talent, while scouts at Linfield and Glentour matches in the mid 1920s, including those from Aston, including those from Aston Villa, Burnley, Liverpool, and Everton. In addition, the sporting press likewise kept its readers acquainted with the scouting activities of football league clubs in, free, in the Irish Free State, a number of whom had dedicated Dublin-based representatives. The newspaper Sports Northern Football Correspondent noted with glee in 1921 that one Cliftonville player was being watched by Swansea Town, Preston North End and Dundee having been brought to attention through his reporting. In addition, at that point, players at lesser known clubs such as Dunmurray and Forth River were attracting the attention of scouts from Everton, Woolwich, Arsenal and Bradford City. That same year, Liverpool and Aston Villa scouts were said to be attending Shelburne matches in Dublin. In March 1922, it was reported that a combination of political unrest and the poor state of the game in Belfast, exacerbated by the loss of Dublin clubs Shelburne and Bohemians following the decision to leave the IFA and join the newly formed FAI in 1921, had led to a situation whereby those who can manage an opportunity to get clear of the city, i.e. Belfast, are embracing the opportunity. Later that month, Glentoran were said to be in the process of losing their four best players to English clubs. Billy Emerson, Billy Crooks, Davy Liner, and Hugh Davy, the latter whom it was stated was not at home at the Oval under present conditions. It was also reported that the IFA's balance had dropped significantly from about £2,000 in hand in 1920 to only £340. By the end of the season, the game was said to be dying a natural death, with gates never great at any period being described as meagre, and the reporter felt that. There won't be any change until Belfast Celtic and the two Dublin clubs return. The political conflict was said to be a concern for players. With the onset of the Irish Civil War in June 1922, it was reported that outdoor sport which attracts a crowd has been at a standstill practically every weekend or the summer. True cricket and boxing flourishes, but it only interests those playing, while at all events those football players who can escape by the open door to clubs not connected with the clubs or by transfer, are tricking it. By October, it was reported that the Irish League clubs were unable to pay players. Gates are so poor and expenses have to be met, so no sooner is a player in the limelight than a cheque is taken for his transfer. Since May last, over 30 good players left Belfast for England and Scotland, and they are still going, it was noted. Dublin clubs were also said to be affected 
and Shelver went practically and blocked. This did little to help these clubs, with teams said to be weakened while the public stayed away. By November 1922, the distillery was said to have released all the professional players, while some players such as Bert Mahaffey, who had a trial period with Tottenham Hotspur, chose to sign for junior clubs on returning to Ireland. With the failure of Irish League clubs to pay big wages, said to have been the reason he decided to join Carrick Fergus Junior Club Woodburn. The following year, Mahaffey signed for New Brighton after a season in junior football. The overall figure for the 1920s, which was 106, dropped in the 1930s to 84 players migrating and playing first team football. As David Thomas has stated, football migration between Ireland and England in the pre World War II years was mainly a one way phenomenon, with the exception of a brief spell during the economic recession of the 1930s, when the Irish Free State became a haven for disgruntled players from the Football League, which may partly explain the reduction in Irish players migrating in this decade. Free State clubs also ran into trouble with the Football League for signing their players during the Depression, with the result that the Football League remained hostile to League of Ireland clubs, refusing to recognise player registration or even to organise representative fixtures until after the Second World War. These factors may help partially explain why the figures for Irish football migrants to England were much lower than in the post-World War II period. The majority of players generally migrated from present-day Northern Ireland. Although the Free State was not established until 1922, um, Northern Ireland had been put in place through the Government of Ireland Act of 1920, as you know. Um, this greater number on a decade-by-decade uh, decade basis, with the exception of the 1910-1919 period, is indicative of the higher standard of the Belfast-based clubs for much of these years. As early as 1902, one Belfast newspaper was noting the undoubted superiority of Belfast over Dublin football, while Dublin-based players moving to Belfast was also said to be getting increasingly frequent by that point. Indeed, Glentorn was found to be the most prominent source club for the overall period, with 24 players leaving from the East Belfast club, while Belfast Celtic followed closely, supplying 22 players. Linfield supplied 16, although figures for Dublin-based clubs were much lower with only six leaving from Shamrock Rovers and three from Bohemians. Overall, Manchester United recruited and gave first team football to the most players, with 11 noted, followed by Leeds City who had 9, Liverpool who had 8, Burnley who had 7 and Arsenal who had 5. During the 1911-12 season, Leeds City's squad contained 11 Irish players, with 7 coming from Belfast and Dublin. So you can see the, the data for the geography of um, Irish-born players in that period. Again, the majority were born in Belfast. Um, there's probably more of them were born in Belfast because some of the data has players down as from areas like Bally McCart and White Abbey outside Belfast. Um, so there's 261 of those players and there was other players then that couldn't be identified. But again, it just shows that the, how strong football was in Belfast in, in the pre-war period and how the players were more highly valued than those down south. So figures from other cities were quite low in comparison, with only 8 or 3% born in Derry City. Um, and Cork-born players made up only 5 of the total identified or 2%. As early as 1906, one Belfast soccer writer noted how Liverpool had been most intimately associated in the football sense with Belfast and some of its clubs in the past. Like Donegal born Billy Gillespie, some players from rural areas did manage to break into English League football, with, for example, North East Donegal born players uh, Charlie and Billy O'Hagan feeling of the close proximity of Derry City with its higher standard of soccer clubs than what was available in Donegal. A few players moved to football league clubs from the lesser ranks of English football. Derry-born centre-half Pat Nealis made his way to Nottingham Forest from Accra Stanley in 1922, having joined the latter the previous year. Sport and newspaper noted the migratory route he undertook to reach that point when they wrote, This chap is a Derry product, and up to two seasons ago he played for Derry Distillery. He went to a small Lancashire club, later to Accra Stanley, and last week to the Forest. 
With Accrington, he scored 14 goals in 11 games. Given the military's presence in Ireland before the initiation of the Irish Free State in 1922, and the level of football available to soldiers, it is notable that some of these Irish footballers have military links. A few players were born in the Curragh camp in Kildare, including Henry Whitworth Garden in 1869. He played once for Derby County in 1892, and probably was the son of an army man who moved back to England after completing his service there. Bill Toms, who joined Manchester United in 1919, was also born there. Similarly, Joe Connor, born in then Kings County in 1877, moved to Scotland as a 15-year-old with his father, a soldier, and played for the Gordon Highlanders before going on to feature for West Bromwich Albion, Walsall, Bristol City and Woolwich Arsenal. One player who gained the attention of Cross Channel Club through involvement in the military was Baird Smith, who was born in Donegal in 1890 and said to have fought in the Indian Army during World War I. He learned to play football in the Army before being signed by Cardiff City in 1920. More famously, Matt Gunner Riley apparently only played Gaelic football in Ireland before coming to prominence playing for Portsmouth faced Royal Artillery in a number of cup finals before appearing in the Southern League for Portsmouth and the Football League for Notts County. He was said to have taken up soccer with Scottish junior club Ben Borg while in Glasgow. J.D. Hanna, an Irish international who joined Nottingham Forest from Linfield in 1911 and made 97 English team appearances, had previously played association football while in the Royal Artillery where he was a sergeant based in Portsmouth. Some other players did not play great as footballers, was Sunderland Sheffield United and Clapton Orient player Peter Boyle migrated to Coatbridge from Carlingford as a child with his family in the 1870s. There he played Gaelic football before joining Albion Rovers and moving to Sunderland in 1896. Similarly, Jack Doran, who played for Brighton, Hove Albion, Man City and Crewe Alexander in the 1920s, was born in Belfast in 1896, but was brought up in the northeast of England and discovered playing junior football in Newcastle. Some players were spotted playing for work teams by Irish League clubs before later moving to England. Belfast born Jackie Brown, who moved to Wolves in 1934 from Belfast Celtic, had been noticed playing for linen manufacturers William Ewart and Son. Less common was the case of Dr John Waddle, a goalkeeper who moved to Gloucester from Ireland in 1906 to work there and signed for the local second division club. Some players moved to English League football via Scottish clubs, while Coleraine born Sam English, who went on to play for Rangers, Liverpool and Hartlepool United, was said to have been a shipboard, shipyard worker on the Clyde when he attracted Rangers' attention. More commonly, players were usually recruited from Irish clubs. Players could also gain the notice of English clubs through word of mouth. In 1922, Glen Torrance Bert Mahaffey went on trial with Tottenham Hotspur, having been recommended to the club by Billy McCracken. At times, players acted as scout and went to watch others. McCracken's move to Newcastle United in 1904 was said to have come after a scouting expedition of another great all-time player, Andrew McCombie, a Scottish international who was at Newcastle United from 1903 until 1909, playing 113 times. While some players undoubtedly gained recognition from English clubs through international appearances, McCracken, who later fell out with the IFA over international appearance money, had never been capped by Ireland prior to moving to Newcastle. Sports reporters felt that, in those days, Irish internationals were not considered of much account. Overall figures for Irish players in English Football League were quite low in comparison with those from England, Scotland and Wales in the opening decades of the 20th century, however. Matthew Taylor has shown that the number of Irish players in English League Football was minimal in the opening decades of the 20th century, with only 9 players from Ireland, or 1%, present out of an overall total of 870 Football League players noted in 1910, with the majority, 77%, hailing from England, while 19% were Scottish, 1.7% were Welsh, while only 5 or 0.6% were deemed to be non-British or Irish. Seven of these Irish <coughs> players were playing in the first division clubs, for which there was a total of 527 players recorded, while only two Irish players were with those in the second division, which were 340 players noted. By 1925, the overall total of Irish players in Football League had risen to just 2% of the overall total of 38 noted. So there wasn't too much of a change at that, at that stage. Um, 
just looking at Scotland before we move on to the United States. Um, by the early 1890s, 194,807 or 4.8% of Scotland's population was Irish born, while the figure for England and Wales was only 1.6% of the overall population of these two countries. As noted earlier, Irish players have been migrating to play for Scottish clubs since the late 19th century, but figures remain relatively low in comparison to wider population trends. In the period from 1890 until 1939, at least 72 Irish-born footballers played in the Scottish First Division and 19 of those were born in Belfast. Overall, movement from clubs in present-day Northern Ireland was again higher, with 48 players who were born there moving to Scotland in the 1888 to 1939 period, as opposed to just 17 from the present-day Republic of Ireland. Um, again, this is indicative of the greater strength of the game and scouting networks in Belfast in the pre-World War II years. Newly born Willie Bailey was part of the Celtic setup in 1888, having played for Cathcart Hazelbank Juniors and third, third Lanark, and appears to have been the first Irish born player to appear in the Scottish First Division, although it seems he did not migrate as a footballer. Similarly, some other early Irish born players did not migrate as footballers, but were resident in Britain, having moved there earlier in their lives. Some players like Peter Boyle moved to English League football via Scottish clubs, although the first Irish football migrant to transfer directly from an Irish League club to a Scottish team appears to have been Belfast man Tommy Ching Morrison. He had previous experience of the game at Burnley before returning to Glentoran. He joined Celtic from Glentoran in the 1894-5 season and later returned to Burnley after three seasons in Scotland. <coughs> As shown here in this table, um, in the period from 1888 until 1899, only five players were identified as joining top flight Scottish League clubs. Again, we say top flight, but there's no real accurate records for those who played in the other Scottish divisions. Um, so you can only go by the, the top flight, the first division, for these records. 1900 to 1909 saw this figure increase to nine, while between 1910 and 1919 there were 19 recorded. Scotland's first division continued through the war, but the second division did not and wages were lessened. A number of clubs outside the central region of Edinburgh and Glasgow, such as Aberdeen, Wraith Rovers and Dundee, stood down to save travel expenses. However, the number of Irish-born players joining Scottish top flight clubs during 1914 and 18 was low, with only seven noted. From 1920 until 1929, there were 24 Irish football migrants noted as moving to first division Scottish clubs. The only slight rise from the previous decade signific differs significantly to migration to England, where there was 106, and this may be indicative of the poor financial state of the game in Scotland in that decade. As will be shown shortly, the 1920s saw a large exodus of Scottish players to the American Soccer League, and admittedly the data for England covers all divisions. In the 1930s, there were only 15 Irish-born players noted as moving to Scottish Division I clubs. <coughs> September 1927, the migration of a number of Irish-born footballers to the American Soccer League club Philadelphia Celtic backfired spectacularly when the club's owner disappeared, leaving the players without wages and accommodation. Football Sports Weekly's reporter on the subject hoped that the episode would be a timely warning to our players and maybe the means of putting a stop to the wise, unscrupulous adventurers who are domiciled in the land of the almighty dollar and also a few nearer home. How exactly did these players find themselves in a situation whereby they attracted this unwanted newspaper attention? This section will examine the migration of Irish-born soccer players to participate in the American Soccer League, the first effort to bring the USA's best teams into a competition. By the late 19th century, various sports had become a major cultural phenomenon in the United States, according to Tindall and Shea. Basketball, college football and baseball were attracting significant support with American football emerging as a modified version of rugby and soccer. Association football or soccer was also beginning to gain popularity there by the 1890s. While there had been football migration to the USA in the years from 1894 to 1921, the first professional soccer league there, the American League of Professional Football, set up by a number of baseball club owners in the hopes that their venues would remain, un would remain occupied over the winter months, lasted only briefly in 1894 with the scheduling of afternoon midweek fixtures unhelpful in gathering support. Although there is evidence that some players were Irish, 
None appear to have migrated through clubs in the English Football League, instead being selected from local leagues in the USA. The American Soccer League was, according to Lanfranchi and Taylor, effectively a multi-ethnic and multinational league, drawing on American-born European personnel, but also importing significant numbers of Austrian, Hungarian, Swedish, Irish, English, but above all, Scottish footballers. One reporter noted that after the opening week weekend in September 1921, how the league, supported by the United States Football Association, was going to challenge more native sports in order to put the game on what its American supporters believed to be its proper place. Thomas Cahill, an American born of Irish parents, was said to be the father of American soccer, and was reported as being the driving sport of the ASL, while it was also noted that the enterprise was well financed. Soccer, the reporter felt, had never really appealed to the United States any more than baseball had appealed in England. He's also known the precarious nature um, of competitive professional soccer in the USA. As David Weinberg has shown, the advancement of a company name was a primary motivating factor for wealthy club owners. As Taylor has stated, based around the number of established clubs and company teams in the Northeast, the ASL drew heavily on immigrant communities as well as Scottish, Irish and other European personnel. Under an immigration bureau ruling, non-American players were allowed into the USA as artists, with footballers being classed alongside musicians, actors and others entering the country to display special accomplishments. Taylor notes that the loss of registered players to the emerging leagues in the USA during the 1920s and France in the 1930s became a highly contentious issue among club and English league officials, mainly because no agreement or transfer payment was necessary. By 1923, it was reported in Irish newspapers that unsatisfactory work conditions in England and Scotland had been a major factor in this movement, with scores of crack footballers taking up position at American clubs. In particular, the Bethlehem Steel team was said to have been almost entirely composed of players from the British Isles who had moved after the closed season with an increase in interest in the game amongst the US public and the availability of sizable sums for players fundamental to this migration. The expansion of the ASL um, from 8 to 12 teams in 1924 meant that there was a greater demand for these British and Irish players, with ASL club owners eager to succeed and strengthen their clubs with players of a higher quality, while some were interested in creating sides with an ethnic identity to gain additional support. Within this increased recruitment, soccer authorities in Britain began to make plans to deal with ASL clubs and authorities' portion of their players, with the Scottish FA holding a special meeting in regard to this in 1925, although at that point there was little they could do to stop players from making the transatlantic trip, despite the British nations rejoining FIFA in 1924. While acknowledging the problems of tracing all of these ASL recruits' uh, birthplaces and nationalities, Lanfranchi and Taylor have identified the Scottish players with the dominant nationality in terms of figures for European footballers playing in the ASL, reaching a peak of 83 in the 1927-8 season. Migratory links with the USA with Scots numerous in the towns and factories in which the ASL was based, along with poor working conditions and low wages in Scot Scotland's football leagues help explain this. <coughs> This season was also when the number of Irish players there was at its highest, with 12 migrating that year. This can be explained by Philadelphia Celtics' recruitment of 11 Irish players in 1927, and this club will be discussed in more detail later. As shown on the left, at least 37 Irish-born footballers played in the ASL, and these figures for migration gradually rose from just one player present in 1921 to the end of the decade when their migration ceased. While after peaking at 12 in 1927, only two were recorded as migrating in 1928. None were recorded as having done so afterwards. The sudden increase to nine in 1924 can be partially explained by the fact that three Irish born players moved from non Irish clubs to the ASL that year. The rise of Irish born players moving to the ASL to 12 in 1927 correlates with the more general movement of British players, which reached its peak in the 1926 9 period with the decline in migration afterwards. Despite the Anglo-Irish War of Independence from 1919-21 and the Irish Civil War of 1922-3 and the financial and political problems in the Irish League in the early 1920s which saw the temporary withdrawal of Belfast Celtic and the permanent movement of Bohemians and Shelburne to the new Free State League 
there is no huge exodus of Irish born players to the USA. This indicates that most did not view soccer in the USA as a popular option and that active recruitment in Ireland by ASL clubs was less common than that of British clubs. While the number of Irish players in England remained low in comparison with those from the home countries, England remained the principal destination for Irish footballers in this decade. As shown in the table on the right, rates of migration of Irish players to the ASL from British clubs remained low, with only eight moving from English league clubs and four from those in Scotland. Among the first of these was Belfast-born Mickey Hamill, who left England in May 1923 for a US tour and a position as player coach at Bridgeport, Connecticut, although it appears he later played out 923-4 season with Man City, but before returning to the USA on a more permanent basis. Along with Hamill, just nine other Irish-born football migrants who played professionally in England's football leagues were identified as having played in the ASL at some point in their career. Two did not move from British or Irish clubs, but appear to have been playing in the no North America, albeit at a lower level than the ASL, where the source club of one Irish-born player could not be traced. A few Irish-born players who moved to America, including Hamill and Mick O'Brien, played in both Scotland and England. The greatest movement of Irish-born players to the ASL came from Ireland rather than Leeds in England or Scotland, with 23 players moving to the USA from Irish clubs. 15 of these were located in present-day Northern Ireland, particularly the Belfast and North East area, which at that point had a stronger concentration of professional clubs than in Dublin. Nine players were recruited from Glentoran, with the Belfast club similarly supplying the most Irish-born players to English league clubs in the pre-World War II period, illustrating the strength of their links with English clubs and evidently those further afield. A higher standard of play than the Irish Free State League appears to be evident north of the border in these years. Only seven moved to the ASL from the Irish Free State, and prior to 1927, there does not appear to have been any direct movement from this league. Six of these joined Philadelphia Celtic in 1927, having been targeted by Fred McGuinness, the owner of Philadelphia Celtic, between 1926 and 27. A few of these, such as Lennox of Bright Fuller, were eager to go too, but had already signed contracts in Ireland and appeared to have been less uh, reluctant or had less nerve to break them. Irish-born players were calculated to play for an average of 2.44 clubs and spent on average 2.6 seasons in the ASL. Most of these were not high-profile players. Only nine players won international caps, with Mick O'Brien featuring for both Irish national teams, while one player, George Graham, a dairyman, was capped by Canada. Picture in the, player, the, the player in the picture there is, is Bob Fulham, who, who played for Shamrock Rovers before moving to Philadelphia Celtic, and he later returned. Um, and was given a great welcome when he returned in 1928. Um, <coughs> so the summer of 1927 was said to have been when Irish-born players' interest in move to the ASL was at its highest, with $20 apparently being offered per match and work equivalent to $25 a week available. At least two of these players moved to the ASL that year were motivated by the low level of pay available to them during the close of the soccer season in Ireland and throughout the summer Despite repeated warnings in the press about the precarious nature of contracts with American clubs and the poor treatment of players, Irish professionals Hugh Reid, Bob McGuire, and William Pitt, who had gained experience of soccer in America, were also said to have been acting as recruiting agents for ASL clubs. The largest grouping of Irish football migrants at any one time were based in Philadelphia, the majority of these having been brought together by Fred McGuinness, who had a specific aim to create a team of Irish players. Despite this, as Steve Holroyd has stated, whether or not he brought them together as a marketing ploy or simply out of national pride is unclear. McGuinness the Presbyterian was born in County Down in 1878 and brought up on Enfield Street in Belfast. By the early 20th century he was employed as a clerk in the county courthouse, but by the 1920s he was residing in New York. He was not the only non-American to back an ASL team, with the Lewis brothers gaining the rights to the Philadelphia team earlier in this decade, while Bethlehem Steel withdrew while Brooklyn Wanderers were funded by an accountant from Sheffield, Nat Agar. It's unclear if McGuinness ever revisited Ireland to obtain players and appears to have used Hugh Reid, seen here in the picture, um, to entice a number of Dublin-based players in 1927. In 1926, McGuinness' brother George, a senior referee with the IFA, was said to have been suspended for helping a Philadelphia agent, Mr Boyd, in seeking new players, um, although he denied any charges. 
Some other clubs attempted to entice players through sending them letters and telegrams, with one Belfast Celtic player offered a decent berth and remunerative wage with the Chicago club in 1926. A few others, including Indiana Flooring and New York Giants, sent their managers to Britain to recruit players. This type of attempt at McGuinness to create an ethnic identity among ASL clubs was not uncommon. The success of a tour made by Austria's top team, Vienna Hakok, in 1926, saw them lose most of their best players to Brooklyn Wanderers and New York Giants, two Jewish-owned ASL clubs, while the owners of Bridgeport, Hungary, and Indiana Flooring of New York also attempted to create teams of strong national ties, recruiting Hungarian and Swedish players respectively. 19 Irish-born players joined Philadelphia clubs at some points during the league's 10 years of existence, and 10 of these were in the Philadelphia Celtic squad at the beginning of the 18 of the 1927-8 season. McGinnis had bought the Philadelphia ASL franchise in 1926 and intended to reinvigorate the now Philadelphia Celtic team by putting together a selection made up of Irish players. Irish league players William Stewart, Arnold Keenan, William Pitt, Dave Rainey, Hugh Reid and Bob McGuire were recruited in 1926, while goalkeeper Alex McMahon, said to be at Stockport County and born in Ireland, was signed in 1927. Those recruited in the latter year from the Free State League included the captain of Dublin club Shamrock Rovers, Bob Fulham, and his teammates Denny Doyle and Alfie Hill Sr., along with Bradfuls, Michael McGuire and Paul O'Brien, and Bray Unknowns, Larry Kilroy. Despite these hopes, by the end of September 1927, the playing arrangements had fallen through after only a few matches, with McGuinness said to have walked out on a team at Wilkes Bar. He'd apparently signed a contract agreeing to pay each of the players $50 a week, with the result that they were left unpaid after he disappeared, and according to one source, the team had to spend two days and two nights in a railway station, having been left stranded and evicted from their hotel. The club was later folded by the American Soccer League, after the merits of McGuinness had attempted to sell all the players to Boston club Fall River Marksman. With the collapse of McGuinness' venture, by October of 1927, these Irish players had to look elsewhere for professional football. Left without a club, Denny Doyle joined Fall River, while Kilroy, Hale, McGuire and William Burns transferred to Coates FC of Rhode Island. These rates of return of these Irish footballers differed slightly to general patterns noted in studies of Irish migrants to the USA. As Kevin Kenny has stated, in the late 19th century, while over 50% of Eastern European and Italian migrants to the US returned home after only a few years, approximately 10% of Irish immigrants went back home. As there was usually little or nothing to go back to in Ireland, with American wakes customary as when they left, they left for good. In total, 19 of the 37 Irish-born players, almost 51%, were positively identified as returning to Ireland after playing in the ASL. Some Irish league players, including Tommy Croft, pictured here, of Queen's Island, and William Reid were fined heavily by the IFA on returning to Irish league football in the late 1920s, but were allowed to play there again having paid their fines. The Football Association of the Irish Free State took a more lenient view and do not appear to find any players. Irish footballers who moved to the ASL knew that, as well as a more familiar environment, a decent standard of football was still available if they did return to Ireland, and they would be reinstated relatively quickly if they complied with football authorities' regulations. As Taylor also notes, the tightening of US immigration controls during the first half of the 1920s was probably more important in encouraging <coughs> European players to visit rather than settle. He sees the rejection of the New York Giants' offer of £23 a week by Everton star Dixie Dean in July 1928 as impacting greatly on the challenge the ASL offered to soccer in Britain, along with administrative conflict and the Wall Street crash. In January 1929, Football League authorities in England and Scotland set up a working agreement with the United States Football Association in regard to respecting registrations and suspensions. According to David Goldblatt, the ASL's decline was due to a row between the United States Football Association and the ASL in 1928, with a number of ASL clubs participating in the USFA's Open Challenge Cup, despite being warned not to do so by the ASL. Three clubs left the ASL and were instrumental in the organisation of the East Coast League, but as Goldblatt states, the quality of play and the attention of the sports audience was too thinly spread. Two poor leagues could not match the interest created by one good one. 
Although the League was later reformed as a single competition, the Depression impacted greatly on clubs with an industrial background, with Fall River and Bethlehem Steel collapsing by the early 1930s, and the League had completely folded by 1933. So just to finish off, um, this paper has examined the early origins of a number of Irish-born footballers in English League football in the pre-World War II period. In particular, it's highlighted the strength of clubs and scouting networks in the Belfast area in the early 20th century, with English clubs apparently putting more value on their talent than those from other major urban areas such as Dublin. Given that the Irish Free State League was not established until 1921, this is understandable, it was not until the mid-1980s that the number of Irish players migrating from then the Republic of Ireland outweighed those from north of the border. Players from rural areas struggled to break into English League football in comparison to Belfast and Dublin in the pre-World War II era, although the case of Donegal illustrates that there were some exceptions. While some players came to English, English football through movement to England with their parents or as part of the military. In general, movement of footballers outside the United Kingdom was not unknown but not common. Unlike more general Irish emigration, Britain has been the main centre of movement for football <coughs> migrants since the late 19th century and throughout the 20th century. The American Soccer League did see some movement of Irish-born players to the US in the 1920s, but these figures, with at least 37 players noted as making the transatlantic trip, paled in significance to more general patterns of Irish emigration to North America. And while Britain took over from this continent as the primary destination of Irish migrants after 1921, the numbers of Irish-born footballers bringing into English League football were much lower on a decade-by-decade -decade basis than in the late 20th century. This talk has also assessed the position of Irish-born footballers within the United States' most prominent soccer league within the early 20th century. And given the nature of professional soccer as a profession and the time frame around which the game developed, Irish football migrant migration to North America differed to that of most Irish migrants and that it generally did not take place during the key period of Irish immigration there, which was during the Great Famine and the First World War. The temporary nature of Irish player settlement in the US in the 1921-31 period has been discussed and has illustrated that this movement was the result of push and pull factors, particularly the opportunity to earn higher wages playing the game than those available in Britain and Ireland's football leagues at that time. This movement was facilitated by some ASL managers and returning players who acted as agents while written communications also help secure their migration. <coughs> Although attitudes of players in respect of professional contracts varied. However, ASL clubs generally did not see Irish players as a major source of recruitment, with numbers paling in significance in comparison with those moving from Scotland, and England remained the primary destination for Irish footballers. Thank you.